Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag, where I answer your questions, your observations, your hot takes, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. Posted on the YouTube community tab, got over 100 responses once again. Thank you to everyone who participates. I pulled about 14 of them, and uh, I'm excited to get into it, because there are some good ones. Big topic off the top. I wasn't surprised at what the most liked comment was, so let's get right into that. It comes from user. Hey Gil, what do you think about Novak splitting with Ivanisevic? Plain and simple, open-ended, let's do it. Uh, so first of all, I kind of want to take a, take a media angle to this right off the top. Because I haven't said anything about it yet, and it happened over a week ago. And the reason for that was I felt I lacked information. I think everybody lacked information. And that puts media in a somewhat difficult spot. I think I can see multiple sides of this. I understand how the industry works. I also, that means I understand the bad sides of the industry as well. And in this case, it's when this coaching split happens, there is a rush to have an opinion on it, to break it down, to analyze it in some kind of way. But the reality is, Nobody knows anything. We hadn't really heard from, from Novak other than a social media post. Those never really tell you anything. We hadn't heard from Goron. So there were a lot of unanswered questions. And um, due to a lack of information, I, I think a lot of people were just kind of flailing around with opinions that weren't really rooted in much of anything other than what they could see. And one of the things that everybody could see was, I don't know, some tense back and forths that Novak had with Goran at the Australian Open, maybe at Indian Wells, right? So we kind of grasped onto that as if it gave us some sort of clue as to what happened there. Eh, that's, that's shaky grounds, huh? Thankfully, we, uh, we did get some information in the form of a long Goran Ivanisevic interview recently. He sat down with Sasha Osmo, I believe, for the outlet Sports Club, Sports Club, and, uh, and, and gave a long interview and talked about it. And one of the things that he vehemently refuted was the idea that these on-court, I'll call them screaming matches— and I don't think that's an over-dramatization. I mean, they, they they went at it a couple of times, especially Novak to Goron. Maybe not, maybe a little bit reciprocating from Goron. Um, you know, the idea that that signaled some sort of fracture in their relationship, according to Ivan Isevich, is untrue. And I think he makes a good point when he says in, in the interview, like, it's not like Novak never yelled at Marion Vida. It's not like Novak never screamed in the direction of Boris Becker. It's not like Andy Murray, who's gone through like 10 coaches in his career, hasn't given a lot of lip to all 10 of them on several occasions. It's not about, you know, the player-coach relationship at that point. It's, it, is it a player who likes to blow off steam in that manner? And Novak is a player who will blow off steam in that particular way. And Goran said, essentially, that he doesn't care. He completely understands it. And it wasn't a problem. And I kind of believe him. I do believe him, actually, fully. By the way, on that note, there is something I always wondered. And I got the answer to it from this interview. I always wondered why Novak's physio seems to be giving him coaching sometimes. I was like, huh, why is the physio, like, why do I see the physio pantomiming the motion of a forehand? Like, how could this be? It turns out Goran does not have a loud voice. And in these stadiums, when Novak was far away or when the crowd was loud, uh, Goran would tell the physio what to say. The physio would relay the message. And that was their little system. Uh, another thing that Goran said is like half the time, um, he wouldn't even hear what Novak is saying. It's too loud. So Novak's yelling and you can't even hear it. Um, it was fascinating to kind of 
hear Ivan Isevich's perspective on on that particular topic. And there's a little bit more where that is coming from. Obviously, the big question is, why did it happen then? What was the reason for the split? And I think the reason Goran gave is probably the most common reason, other than a player getting impatient with their results, the most common cause of a coach-player split, which is one side or both sides mutually get sick of each other. These relationships often have an expiration date. These players, when they're on the road, often see the members of their team more often than they see their families. And that can be hard. And after five years, which is a long time, a very long time, that can begin to wear thin on both sides. And I believe it did. It's not unlike a carton of milk. And when a carton of milk goes bad, you don't say what was wrong with the milk. You accept that the milk had the, had the lifespan that it had. And in this case, it was a long one. And that it's only natural that at some point that comes to an end. Even such a successful partnership that this was. Which, I, I that's probably the direction that I would have gone. Like, let's say my editor, let's say I worked at some sort of publication, or maybe if I had more time on my hands, I would have actually done this. If I had to immediately talk about the Goran Novak thing, um, I might offer certain tentative speculations about what may have happened or what what may have the what maybe the reasons were. But I think where I, what I where I would have gone with it is just to talk about how amazing the relationship was. Because to me, the credit always goes first and foremost to the player. Like that is always true, no matter what happens. But if you really look at even Isevich's piece in it. No player in the history of the game has ever had such a successful adaptation into a post-prime phase of their career. Can you call it post-prime? I don't know, because the 30s were just as fruitful, if not more fruitful, for Novak Djokovic than his 20s. And part of that was an adaptation in the way he was playing and going about his tennis, which Ivan Isevich in large part oversaw. And I think he fully surpassed the expectations that were the initial expectations of what Ivan Isevich's role was going to be because he was brought in by Novak and Vida as a serve doctor. And he became way more than a serve doctor. Obviously becoming the full-time coach, Sticking with Novak alongside Novak through some very turbulent times, which is another thing that he brought up over and over again in the interview, and something that I think he managed extremely well because he was always there for Novak. He was staunchly loyal to Novak, and I think that that was essential given everything that was going on in the background. So, you know, even Isevich gets a 10 out of 10 and an A+. Plus, and he knows that. And, you know, I think... Novak is proud of it and Goran is proud of it and they should and they should be. The one thing that I don't think Ivanisevic said that I will say is this. New is exciting. Excitement I think is needed right now. What Goran did say is that motivation as I suspected became a major problem in Indian Wells in March. Let me read you the quote here, actually. Uh, quote from Goran. Novak has won everything there is to be won in tennis. Finding motivation every day. I'm with him in training sessions and I watch it. It's not easy to come every day to training and to motivate yourself. It's easier for the slams, but for these masters, it's hard to train with intensity over and over again, even for a perfectionist such as he. It requires strength, passion, willpower. He wanted something different. To be more with family. And that's the reason he gave for withdrawing from Miami. So clearly that's a challenge right now. Motivation. As I suspected that it would be in general. Now I, I did think and I still think that the Olympics are going to operate as a motivational North Star for Novak Djokovic as 2024 continues. But I think with, with all of that said, um, the fact that motivation became such an obstacle 
also speaks to potentially a need for a spark. And for me, somebody new in Novak's corner can certainly provide an extra sense of spark. New is exciting, especially when you are, uh, you know, a student of the game. But I think for anybody, when you have somebody, when you have a fresh voice, it can provide you a little bit of jump, a little bit of a boost. And maybe Djokovic just felt he needed that. I think that would make a lot of sense. So who is next? Um, Andy Roddick said something on TC Live. He, may, he, I think he said it on his podcast as well but I first heard it on TC Live. There is really no time for experimentation with the timing of this all. This is a busy summer. It's going to come around fast. I think Goran said something similar as well in the interview. There's no time really for something not to work here. The clock is ticking. Djokovic can't experiment right now. So he needs to go to somebody who he's familiar with and somebody who he is well aware of pretty much what he's going to get with this person. And ideally, there would have been some sort of previous relationship for all of that to be the case. Uh, the other thing, well, okay, so so with that said, I did make a list of candidates. I know nothing. I have no inside information. Here are the names that came to mind. Obviously, the front runner at this point is the man who is serving as what I'll call right now the interim head coach, Nenad Zimanich. They've, you know, they played Davis Cup together for 15 years, all-time great doubles player. Uh, th there's a relationship there, and maybe Zimanich will become the full-time head coach uh, in title, which is something that Goran personally advocated for. Boris Becker, he's available. He's a known entity. It's worked in the past. Marion Vida. I don't think they're going to go back to that, but it can't be ruled out. I'm not sure what's happening with Molchan. That's who Vida was coaching last I checked. Um, things have kind of gone the wrong direction for Molchan, which I've been surprised about. Uh, but certainly Vida is a name that you have to bring up. I think Victor Troitsky is likely to be in the mix. Now, Victor is coaching... Hamad Majedovic. Novak cares very deeply about Majedovic's development. There is no way he would take Troitsky from Hamad if he felt like that was going to be to Hamad's detriment or if that was going to hurt Hamad in some way. I don't think he would do that. Um, but potentially the three of them you know, might land in a, in a place where Viktor Troitsky could could help with with coaching Djokovic. I don't know. I think Ivan Chinkas uh, deserves a mention here. Longtime coach for Marin Cilic, did a fantastic job coaching Marin Cilic, and uh, he's moved on to Ketsmanovic, but I'm not sure if that's active right now. Not positive. But I know last I checked, he was coaching Ketsmanovic. And the last name I'll throw out is Andre Agassi. I think he is one of the few outsiders who Novak has an enormous amount of respect uh, f for the tennis knowledge that's there, and he would probably be very interested. It would come down to more how interested would Andre be. Andre would be difficult to sell, I believe. Anyway, that's my list of candidates. Zimanich, Becker, Vida, Troitsky, Chinkas, Agassi. Um... The last thing I want to address is this larger ph philosophical question of why does Novak Djokovic need a coach and what does he look for in a coach? And I think the answer is uh, a lot more logical than you may think it is. Like I, I feel like people can kind of miss something that might sound very obvious as soon as I say it, which is that somebody has to put in the hours. Like this is a job that requires a certain amount of work that Novak would likely, it's, it's work that Novak would likely want done by somebody. And that somebody is not going to be himself. 
So it's that simple. It's not about somebody coming in with some level of knowledge that Novak doesn't have. And that's where people get tripped up. They think, how is somebody going to come in and teach Novak? A coach who's developing a young player, whether it be a, a junior or a younger pro, there might be a lot of teaching going on. And with Novak, that's not the case. It's not about teaching. It's about pouring over match footage, looking at analytics, designing practice schedules, making the kinds of decisions that uh, about scheduling and, and drilling that might take a certain mental energy that uh, Novak doesn't want to make necessarily all these decisions by himself or do all this scouting by himself or rewatch the match that he just played, right? Like, that's not fun. That's hard work. You got to put in the hours. So he needs somebody who he trusts, somebody who he respects, and somebody who communicates well with him to put in those hours and do the job. That's why Novak Djokovic needs a coach, because that job doesn't get done unless somebody does the job, right? Now, maybe the other thing is that somebody could come in and just offer a new approach to on-court coaching. Because although Goran made it very clear that the the communication or the tension on court that they sometimes had did not affect their relationship, was not a splinter in any way, or did not lead to this breakup, he was pretty detailed in explaining that the on-court communication wasn't always very effective, and that oftentimes Novak would want certain things that the the box given the mechanics of the communication was unable to actually offer to Novak and part of that was not on Goran part of that was on Novak it was probably just both of them never really connecting on a way where both of them could execute a more effective communication strategy and i wonder if someone comes in and it's look if you want coaching, you come to the towel box. Come towel off and we'll talk. None of the yelling, hand signaling uh, stuff that turned into very chaotic uh, and, and theatrical moments at times. But it was, you know, at the end of the day, even if, even if it was, if there were no hard feelings there and it had nothing to do with any sort of deterioration of the relationship, it still probably wasn't the best way to communicate and coach. During the match. And when even Isevich and Novak started, there was no on court coaching. So the rules changed, the expectations changed, and I'm not sure they ever really developed a really good rapport in that respect. So maybe somebody comes in and can do a better job there. All right, that's all I got. Let us move on. Next one's from HR5867. This one also got a lot of likes. Could you do a tier list of major tournaments by court speed, official CPI, and maybe some explanation of how the surface interacts with types of shots at that event? I do not have a, an official list of CPI, but I, I think I could have dug that up if I tried. But um, I do have a recent metric that I believe in that was developed by Jeff Sackman of Tennis Abstract. I'm going to take this moment also to plug the draw. Uh, next week, next week's edition of the draw will have this Goran Ivanisevic interview uh, linked. So if you somehow weren't able to to see that or track it down, and you don't feel like looking for it right now, uh, go to the draw tennis. Subscribe to my new newsletter where I curate the best tennis content on the internet every week, and uh, you will be linked and served up on a platter in your email inbox the Goran Ivanisevic interview. If you were subscribed to the draw and you opened the email a few weeks back, you also would have seen um, a link to this Jeff Sackman blog that dealt with Hugo Umber and surface sensitivity. And in that piece, Jeff created a power ranking of a metric that measured serve impact. Serve impact is not a perfect way to evaluate court speed, but as you'll see when I read off this list, it comes really, really close to accurately representing 
just how fast a court is playing because the faster a court is playing, or at least the more a court is rewarding aggression and attack and offense, which is really, I think, what we're trying to decipher, uh, the more the serve, which is the fastest, most damaging shot in the sport, the more effective that is going to be. So uh, I will I will read off this list, all right? Starting with fastest. Stuttgart, Next Gen Finals, Tour Finals, Wimbledon, Shanghai, Hala, Queens Club, Basel, Washington, Dubai. I'll start there. That's the top 10. That sounds right to me. All of those events are events that I've always thought of as being very fast. Next batch, we have Antwerp, Stad. Stad is the first clay court event, but Stad is at altitude. It is fast. Um, in this case, you know, we'll call it medium fast. Then we have Australian Open, Davis Cup Finals. I guess Davis Cup Finals means Malaga, Spain, those indoor hard courts that they play the finals in. Uh, so yeah, Malaga. Uh, Cincinnati, Paris Masters, Vienna, Miami Masters, Madrid Masters, U.S. Open. We talk all the time about how Madrid, faster clay. Uh, the only thing that surprised me here is Paris Masters being as high as it is on this list. Because I, I do think about Paris as one of the, certainly one of the slower indoor hard courts. That said, when you really think about it, even if the conditions are slower, when you completely take wind out of the equation, that makes it easier to serve, that makes it easier to attack, and that is going to have an effect on a metric such as serve impact, the metric that we're dealing with here. Okay, then we continue down the list. We get Canada Masters, Rotterdam, Indian Wells, Rome, Acapulco, Barcelona, Roland Garros, Monte Carlo. That's the end of the list. That aligns pretty closely with what I would have thought, which obviously makes me more inclined to trust the metric when it kind of aligns with what what you what you've discerned from results, from the eye test, from player testimony, which can sometimes be all over the place. Next one is from HM. This was posted uh, just six hours before I took the comments, so nobody liked this, but I do want to talk about it. Have you seen the umpire debacle during the green match? Do you think there should be consequences to umpires making mistakes? Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. I was on the air, actually, when it happened. I wasn't calling the match specifically, but I was calling a different match and I was keeping an eye on it. And then we ended up in the broadcast going back and playing it for the viewers and talking through what happened. I try not to be too hyperbolic when I talk about tennis. I just try to be careful, right? Because there are a lot of things going on in the world that are a lot bigger than tennis matches. So allow me to preface what I'm about to say with that qualifier. This is sickening. This was, this made me sick to my stomach. Really. It made me sick to my stomach. It was uh, one of the worst umpiring calls I have ever seen by Christian Rask. If you missed it, uh, basically Borges hit a shot that was, uh, actually no, sorry. Let's go back. Green hit a shot that hit the back of the baseline. They're playing in Portugal. Nuno Borges is Portuguese. Shot hits off the very back of the baseline on a massive break point. Um, and there are people in the crowd who are making noise and yelling out, 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 right? This is normal. Anytime you get a very amped up crowd, particularly, you know, in, a, in an environment where a, a home player is involved. Anytime you have that and there's a close call that might go f towards the player that everybody is rooting for, there are murmurs in the crowd when this happens. Some people may even say out. Okay, we continue. Borges plays the shot off the back of the baseline. 
and you could see his body slightly relax just a little bit. Garin has a easy short ball forehand, and he hits it into the alley. He hits the forehand into the alley, clearly trying to play the shot. Clearly. But as soon as he misses it, he goes to the umpire, he throws his hands up, and he's I don't know exactly what he said, but I imagine he said, like, it was called out and he stopped. He stopped. And somehow, and this is still beyond me, it doesn't make any sense to me, somehow they gave Gareen the point. So I suppose they called hindrance on Borges? Because if the crowd, if something so disruptive happens in the crowd that you can't continue playing, that's a let. That's not Gareen's point. That's a let. So they called hindrance on Borges. How is it his fault that people in the crowd were yelling out? And what Gareen said, that that he stopped and that Nuno Borges stopped. No, no. Gareen did not stop. He kept playing and he missed the forehand. And then somehow he was awarded the point. Atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. Look, the same thing happened with Djokovic and Luka Nardi. And in that case, um, in that case, Djokovic was wrong. If there's a close call and a player relaxes their body, that does not mean the point is over. It doesn't. The, you know, that is not them stopping the point. Just because they relax their body does not mean that they are guilty of hindrance. And it does not mean that they have conceded the point. You have to play the next shot. If if Borges had stopped playing, that's advantage to Green. Hit a winner if he stopped playing. Hit it in the court. If he made the forehand, guess what would have happened? He wouldn't have complained. The umpire wouldn't have called hindrance. They called the supervisor on the court. He didn't do anything. It's crazy. You know, the supervisor never changes the call. What is the point of having tournament referees, tournament uh, officials? What is the point if they never, ever, ever change the call? That it's always whatever the chair umpire, uh, whatever the chair umpire's initial decision is, it always stands, even if it's boneheaded and wrong. And this was. Now to add to it, and this is what really got me. First of all, that was a big break point. They ended up going to a million more deuces, and ultimately Gareen held, and then the second set went to a tie break, and Gareen won the tie break. By the way, Christian played impeccable tennis. Best I've seen him play in a, in a long, long time. Um, you know, Estoril has not been put on the 2025 calendar. They have not found a spot for it. It, it seems like there's a chance that they might in the future, that the tournament might not really be dead for good. But Nuno Borges is a rising, you know, is a, is a Portuguese star who's just coming into his own and kind of taking the torch that was carried for so long admirably by Joao Souza. And this might be his last chance to play Estoril. And that BS happens... That makes me sick. I still don't get the logic. Awful. All right, next one's from Anonymous Tennis Follower. Hi, Gil. Igus Fiontech has suffered three losses this year, all of them to flat power hitters. Niskova, Kalinskaya, Alexandrova. Without losing sight of her impressive 22-3 and record and amazing consistency, it is extremely concerning to see her continually lose to the same type of player. What tactics can he, can she employ to counter such players? I've seen fans online try to self-diagnose and say she should push slash junk ball slash moon ball slash use variety like drop shots and slices. But I have my doubts on whether some of these strategies would work, especially when the power hitter is, in, is peaking on a faster court. I am, however, in favor of Sviantec introducing more variety into her game. Okay, so what should Iga do in these matches? And you can kind of throw in the fact that Rybakina has had a good amount of success against Iga. Ostapenko has had 
a lot of success against Iga. Danielle Collins, I suppose, has has beaten you know Iga in a in a big match going back to the Australian Open. Couple things. First all, first of all, her serve. All of these players, except maybe for Colin Skaya, try to get an aggressive first strike in off the return of serve, particularly the second return. And Iga's serve allows for them to do that. It is not at the level of some of the the top play, the other top players in women's tennis. It's not. It's not like Coco or Elena or Arena, who serve too big to allow a player like Ostapenko uh, or Niskova or Alexandrova to tee off on those second returns. Sviantek has made adjustments to her serve in the offseason. I, I, I fail to see at this point how those adjustments have helped whatsoever. In fact, in, in the case of, of many of the technical adjustments that she's made, I don't even understand what she was going for with them. So the serve is one part of it. The second thing here is I think that Sviantek tries to fight fire with fire against these opponents. They are attacking players. They threaten her with their power. And I feel that Iga's reaction to that is to try to make them defend. And you understand where that desire comes from if you're Iga Sviantek. We've talked about this with other players. It's a natural reaction to have. It's the same reaction that Yannick Sinner had when Daniil Medvedev came out in the Australian Open and started attacking him with a with a level of uh, proactiveness that Yannick simply wasn't ready for and a high level of execution. Um, we've talked about it with Alcaraz as well, who has similar qualities to Sviantek in the sense that he actually likes to be in control despite him being a terrific athlete. Sviantek, same thing. Incredible mover, laterally as quick as anybody else on tour, matched probably only by Coco Goff. But she doesn't want to get pushed around. She doesn't really accept that role on the tennis court, especially when she doesn't have to. So I think against these players who threaten her offensively, she tries to get more offensive. She looks to force the issue presses, makes more errors. That forehand in the common thread in a lot of these matches against uh, against the bigger hitters is Sviantek has less time on her forehand and she tries to do more with her forehand and it's not really a shot that's built to survive that combination. Like it is not... I, I love Iga's forehand when she has time and when she's looking to generate off of it. I do not love it when she's rushed. And when she is rushed, she uh, to me, I, I think she needs to dial back the aggression. Now, I also think she should move back. She does not like to cede court position in these matchups. It's funny because she used to. You know, when she was a, a younger player, she played from further back. She played with more height. She played with more spin. Against these players, I would I think that she should go back to that modem a little bit more. Buy yourself some time. Move back. They are aggressive players. That's okay. Let them be aggressive players. You are not going to constantly make them defend. It's not the way to beat them. Sometimes it can work if Iga is on a has a great day. She can, you know, fight fire with fire and uh just kind of turn them into <clears throat> turn them into the nail instead of the hammer. But sometimes I think Sviantek needs to have more of an acceptance. Be the nail, use your speed, trust your athleticism, keep the ball on the court, add a, you know, buy yourself some time, let them miss. Goes back to the Sinner Medvedev thing. That's what Sinner did in the in the Miami final. Let him miss. That sometimes needs to be the reaction when players are bringing a ton of uh, proactive offense to the court against you. Iga doesn't really have that mode. And that's what I've observed in those matchups. Next one from Malakat. Hey Gil, how do you think Sinner's clay season will go this year? 
Do you think that Sinner will dominate the clay season like he dominated this this stretch of the year? Anyways, thanks as always. Enjoy yourself during the clay swing. Uh, appreciate that. All right, so I've, I did answer this, right, last week, but I'll I'll give you a different answer because I gave it a little bit more thought, and I think I can boil it down to a couple of things. What I said, it was either the last mailbag or maybe the mailbag before, is that I can't possibly think of a reason to be concerned about Sinner on clay. I also said that this new and improved version of Sinner, this you know fully formed version of Sinner, even though Yannick and his team might even take issue with that characterization of fully formed, I think you get what I'm saying. This elite version of Yannick Sinner has yet to even play a clay court season, and therefore I find the statistics to be a misrepresentation. But in in getting more philosophical about it, I, I pushed myself to think about it and ask myself the question, why don't I have concerns about Sinner on clay? There are a couple of... Uh, Areas where I will scrutinize a player when evaluating how clay is going to affect them. First thing, will you hold up physically because it's going to get more physical? So that's the first thing. And I have full confidence in Yannick physically now. Second thing, are you consistent enough to play the extra shots? It's not always a fitness thing. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it has to do with other factors and uh, you need to have a repeatability in your sustained aggression and a consistency in your aggression in order to have success on the surface because it's going to be, you know, if it's two shots on a quick hard court, it's going to be four shots on clay. That's just the reality of it. Sinner's consistency is not a concern. Third question, do you have the weight of shot? to get the ball through the court. If you are an underpowered player, unless you are a consistency and fitness animal, a consistency and fitness monster, like some of the clay court specialists are, I guess you could say. Uh, now, now, most of them don't have success at an elite level. I think of like a Roberto Carbias Baena or something like that. Um, a lot of the the weaker players, so to speak, the players with less weight of shot actually want a quicker court so that they are penalized less for their lack of power. So weight of shot is very important, even though clay is a lot of the times falsely associated with defense. And obviously Yannick Sinner checks the box in that area. You have no worries that Sinner is going to be able to get the ball through the court pretty much regardless of who he's playing. If you throw on top of it his added creativity and his ability to finish at net, you become even more confident in it. So physicality, consistency, weight of shot, I and I can't bring myself to be worried about center. Now, will he continue to dominate? Look, I, I think we've talked about it, but there's a real question of if anybody could sustain the pace that center's on. And the answer to that is probably no. But the second thing is that his main rival is Carlos Alcaraz, and we've talked about this, despite the result in Umag, the clay helps Alcaraz in the head-to-head, -head, in the matchup. And if you want my my lowdown or my summary on why I feel that's the case, uh, check out my TikTok. My, uh, my editor, Maggie, just put together a great TikTok on the subject. Obviously, it's me talking, but she uh, she put it together. This is a really long one. But it's a really good one. It's from Arm Leg. Hi, Gil. Thanks for the amazing coverage. This is a long one. It's about Daniil Medvedev's matchup against Yannick Sinner. I go to the Miami Open every year, and I was lucky enough to view the Sinner Medvedev final last year and semifinal they played this year. Of course, Sinner was a bit sick last year, but even still, this version of Sinner is almost unrecognizable. In last year's math match, Medvedev's path to victory was quite simple. He hit enough backhand trades cross court and Sinner will cough up an error. Now I could be wrong because I don't have the stats, but I swear I didn't see Sinner miss a single neutral backhand trade. The aggression that Medvedev brought in the first two sets in the Australian Open final did not seem to bother Sinner much in Miami. In my opinion, it was the unexpectedness of the tactic combined with Sinner's first slam final jitters that made Medvedev so successful in Melbourne. Because taking a step back, I don't think, quote, beat Sinner in a slugfest is a realistic strategy for Medvedev. 
I think it was a strategy that took advantage of a very specific moment. Towards the end of last year's Miami Open semifinal, Medvedev reverted back to his old strategy, deep return position, off-pace backhand trades to minimal avail. Sorry, I said last year, but that was this year. So towards the end of this year's Miami Open semifinal, uh, Medvedev reverted back, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. When watching this match, I couldn't help but notice that Medvedev's only significant adjustments came in his ball speeds, return position, and how close to the lines he aimed. Whether he was more or less aggressive with his ground strokes, they were always flat and always linear. Contrast that with the adjustments we saw Alcaraz make at Indian Wells, where he played more slices, more high heavy spin, came to the net more often, played more drop shots, etc. Medvedev is an incredibly accomplished player and very tactically gifted, but I feel that he is limited by his own technique in that he has a much narrower range of potential strategies that he could employ due to how he produces his shots. Or put another way, I'm sure that Medvedev knows what Alcaraz did to beat Sinner at Indian Wells, but does not have it in him to produce that type of variety off of his ground strokes. So my questions are, do you think that Medvedev has to add these dimensions to his game in order to beat this new version of Sinner, or do you think that there is some strategy that he could employ with his current tools to reverse the negative head-to-head -head trend? And do you think that it is possible at this stage of Medvedev's career to add these tools, higher topspin, backhand slice, etc., or is it unrealistic? So first of all, I need to compliment you. This is an unbelievably well-written comment. And uh, I can tell you are a phenomenal observer um, and, and analytical tennis mind. So my kudos to you. And by the way, Sinner made no backhand on forced errors. So your observation was correct. And this is another thing that I put in the latest edition of The Draw. Craig O'Shaughnessy actually doesn't believe in the unforced errors stat. So he is a different way of uh, tagging and charting tennis. And he loves to look at total errors. The total error stat is probably more impressive than the unforced error stat, which was zero, because total errors, ground strokes, two. Two total errors off the center backhand all match. Dimitrov, 14. Unbelievable. Okay. Um, to answer your questions, do I think that Medvedev has to add these dimensions to his game? in order to beat this new version of Sinner. Look, maybe it would be nice, but I think it's better to start with the second question that you asked, and then I'll go back to your first. The second question you asked is, is it realistic? Look, I think no. Uh, he is never going to be a player who naturally imparts heavy topspin on the ball. Um the backhand slice is very, very, very far from something that is going to be natural to him. Um, it's just, you know, the way he's developed technically is not going to allow him to have a great backhand slice. Just like the way he's developed technically is never going to allow him to have great volleys, even though sometimes I think his pure dexterity and racket talent can sometimes make up for that lack of technique at the net. Now, Medvedev has proven me wrong before. He currently hits the ball harder, or at least has an ability to hit the ball harder than I ever thought he would have the ability to do. You know, if, if you asked me in 2019 or 2020, when Medvedev was, was truly limited in terms of his ground stroke speed capabilities, and he has really ramped that up starting last, last year. So he, he did prove me wrong in that area. But yeah, I think there are real limitations. And Everybody can't be everything, you know? The reason this is part of why we enjoy the game is that some players are going to have certain strengths and weaknesses that just aren't fixable, and it's going to be what it's going to be. I think next time Medvedev plays center, he should go back to what he's best at and back himself and um, look at how he played center in Vienna and how he played center in Beijing. Because those were the only two matches where I think he fully committed. He had full confidence and trust in playing Daniil Medvedev tennis. And those two matches were really good 
close competitive matches. I think he needs to go back to doing what he does best, and he needs to go back to serving at an elite level. And if the second thing doesn't happen, then I don't think he has any chance. Period. He, he just has to serve better. That's that's kind of where I'm, I've been drawing the line in, in regards to his ability to, to win those matchups. All right, next one from uh, John John. Gil, despite Sinner being successful since the last few months, what else do you think he needs to improve to take his game even further? At times, he still looks hesitant at net or seems to struggle to put the ball away on volleys. Also feels like he stopped using the drop shot like he did last year. Seems like he can push his opponents deep, but doesn't always drop and instead goes for the drive into the open court more. So maybe variety and better hands. Secondly, if you had to choose who who's the better mover, Sinner or Alcaraz, Sinner seems more lengthy and tactical on the stretch, while Al Alcaraz seems more explosive and ath athletic on the stretch. Thoughts? So for Sinner, we're, we're in a place where there's no one single part of his game that is lagging behind the rest. Mentally, physically, technically, nothing's lagging behind. Even if we break down the technical aspect into small individual points. At least nothing's severely lagging. So if that's the case, and I know that this can be a boring answer, it's no longer about let's find the weakest link and try to improve that to create a stronger chain. It is let's try to make every single link on the chain stronger. So the serve, despite it being vastly improved, can it get better? Uh, can he get even more physical? Can he get even faster? Can the forehand get even more consistent? I do think you are correct, though, to point out that if there's one area where he's still very much sub-elite, it is his hands, his hand skills when it comes to hitting uh, hitting the backhand slice, although it's, it's all right, it's competent, uh, hitting drop shots, hitting drop volleys. These are things that he can definitely still improve. So I think the four-court game will be a work in progress. I still think the serve can get better. Remember, he's he's still pretty he's still pretty young in terms of his serve revolution. So since changing his technique into something that he feels really comfortable with, he's only been serving that way for less than a year. So you have to think that it's there might be some small tinkering or just the fact that the more he gets reps, the uh, the better it's going to become. Plus, if he gets physically even stronger than he is right now, it's also going to improve the surf. As far as movement is concerned, Alcaraz is the better mover. Sinner can be more tactical. You're right. Um, Sinner is a little bit more balanced. They're both very balanced, but I think Yannick at this point, especially on his backhand side, is probably a little more balanced than Alcaraz. Sometimes that helps Yannick hit a better ball when he's stretched out, but that doesn't mean he's a better mover. It just means to the ball that he got to, like when he gets to the ball, he can oftentimes hit a better ball. That doesn't mean that there are balls that Alcaraz can get to that Sinner can't, because I, I think 100% there are a lot of balls that Alcaraz can get to that sinner can't. Hi, Gil. Thanks for all the great work. I wanted to talk about Tsitsipas. His overall backhand weakness, drive slice return, is an obvious thing that we've been discussing for the last three years, at least, and there have been no signs of improvement. Indeed, this is a major thing that's been holding him back. However, personally, I think I've noticed his forehand deteriorating considerably in the past year. In my opinion, he used to have a top three forehand on tour, maybe even the best, on some of his good periods. Right now, it seems far from these standards. Have you noticed the same? Also, do you see any straightforward technical slash tactical fixes to his backhand problems, take back footwork, etc.? Thanks in advance. I, I, I wish I had a better answer to this question because I do feel that Tsitsipas has been a little bit of a blind spot for me in the last month or so. The only match that I've done a real deep dive technical analysis for with Steph has been his Australian Open match against Fritz. I thought his forehand was good in that match. I think it was Taylor's ability to break down the backhand. 
that was uh, the main factor. Taylor's ability to take his backhand down the line and, uh, you know, catch catch Tsitsipas leaning to his left on a regular basis. And Fritz served extremely well. He outserved Tsitsipas in that match. So, you know, Tsitsipas did not serve well. He did not serve well. If you look statistically at Steph, as I have, one thing really stands out this year. His first serve in percentage, it has plummeted. His first serves in percentage right now is 56.9%. He has never in his career been that low. His career average is 62.3, but last year he was 64. And in fact, if you look at the regular trend, his first serves in percentage has been going up, up, up the last couple of years, the last few years. And now it's just plummeted through 17 matches played in 2024. His hold percentage has gone down. His break percentage is actually up from last year. But his win percentage is down. So, um, has has his forehand deteriorated? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm going to give you an I don't know on that, unfortunately. I... Uh, Obviously, he's played two power players over the course of the Sunshine Swing. He played Shapovalov. He played Yuri Lehechka. Uh, he, he did have a win over Tiafo at Indian Wells, which was a good win. Um, but Lehechka and Shapovalov are going to bring high, high, high levels of pace. And I've always felt that Tsitsipas can be vulnerable to that, especially on his backhand side. It can be extremely vulnerable to players who can simply hit the cover off the ball. Um and also serve big, and both of them serve big. Yeah, so so that's that. I have to leave it at that. I know that's not the best answer. I'm sorry. From SJ. Hey, Gil, I was watching the tennis TV highlights of Ferrer versus Murray at the Miami final. I want to say it was 2013, and a few things jumped out at me. One, poor Ferrer. He had a match point at five at 6-5 add-in. Murray hit a shot that looked out. Ferrer challenged and stopped the point, but the ball clipped in by a centimeter or so. Ferrer literally was as close to winning that Masters 1000 as physically possible and lost the match in the end. Yeah, don't remind me. Two, the surfaces have sped up, have sped up relative to that 2013 match. I notice people still complaining about surface homogenization or surfaces being slow in general, but that's not really the case anymore. What's the deal with that? Miami, US Open, AO have all sped up. My only real complaint is that at this point, US Open and Australian Open are nearly identical surfaces and Wimbledon is only slightly faster, making three out of the four slams really favor faster surface players. What do you think the ideal surface balance is? I think RG should be slowed down a bit more, and then one of AO or US Open should slow down, while Wimbledon can get just a bit faster. I do think modern servers are a bit too good for a surface like Turin, which is just so fast that you rarely see breaks of serve unless Novak or Sinner are super dialed in. A couple of things. One, Crandon Park, Miami, was undoubtedly way slower than current Miami. I won't refute that. But you do have to keep in mind the head-to-head -head that you're watching. Murray and Ferrer are always going to make a court look slow because of their, their speed and their ground stroke power. So uh, you're right. Like it, it feels like they're going corner to corner and every ball is getting tracked down and they can't hit through each other. 100%, that's what that match looked like. But obviously, if you put like Alcaraz and Sinner on that same court, it's going to look faster. In terms of, but your question here is, what do you think the ideal surface balance is? I think I disagree with you on a, on a lot of these actually. So RG, I've never felt like it's, I've never felt like it's fast. I've I've always felt like it's appropriate, and I wouldn't want it to be slowed down any more than it is. I do share your complaint that the Australian Open and the U.S. Open are basically the same hard court. But I would also contend that the way it used to be with the U.S. Open being very slow, I didn't like that. Not at the end of the year in the brutally hot conditions of New York in late August, start of September. I thought it was basically a war of attrition. It was just too physical. And like, look, all the credit in the world to like a 
Pablo Carreño Busta, but I felt that it was favoring a Pablo Carreño Busta quite a bit, made two semifinals. And I don't know if that was best for the product. Australian Open, the players are fresh. Yes, it is hot. But I think at the start of the year, that is where I think maybe the the tennis would benefit a little bit more from, okay, this is the slower hard court major. And it would be nice to have that contrast. We don't currently have that. Wimbledon, bit faster. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think it, it slowed down a lot. If you look at the overall trend since early 90s, start of the 2000s, on and on and on, it's, it's undoubtedly slowed down a lot. But I enjoy Turin. I think Turin's a nice change of pace. I understand that there's a lot of holds of serve, that there's a lot of tie breaks. I get that. And uh, would I get sick of that if uh, if it was kind of week in, week out, a common thing? I totally would get sick of that. But the fact that it's such a novelty for me is actually kind of fun. Let's go to Antoni. Hi, Gil. Andy Roddick spoke on his podcast about hating it when commentators claim player X is making too many mistakes, as this is the direct result of their opponent making them take bigger risks and play outside of their comfort zone or normal style, as that's the only avenue they have to try and achieve a positive result. While that's certainly something I think we can feel while watching the match, do you think that there is a statistic that might be monitored to support that claim? i.e. to see if a player consistently makes their opponents make more errors than they do on average? Or are there just too many factors involved to get comparable data? Thanks. I think Andy was saying that in regards to, and I'm guessing, I actually don't know, um, but I think he was saying that in regards to Medvedev making a lot of errors against Sinner. It's something that I said in my analysis that the fact that Daniil felt the need to leave his comfort zone and play a different way a more aggressive way um, in order to beat Sinner, that's the cause effect. Cause being the great tennis that Yannick has played in previous meetings, effect being all the unforced errors that Medvedev made, Sinner deserves credit. And it shouldn't be written off as, oh my God, Medvedev had this weird, awful, random, erratic day in the office that can't be explained. I think that's what Andy was probably saying. Statistically, it is tough because these kinds of things can take a lot of different forms. But one thing you can look at is rally length. Is a player making a lot of unforced errors on serve early in rallies? Or just early, you know, in the one through four shot rally length in general? Are there a lot of unforced errors in that rally length? Because if that's the case likely they did not the other player did not do all that much to earn that unforced error it came very early on in the point and that tells you something about the nature of the unforced error when when we're on shot 20 of the rally and a player makes an unforced error that's a very different thing so that's one example of you know, uh, how statistics can uh, kind of show you what's going on there. But a lot of the time, stats won't won't hold your hand and tell you what is causing an error. That's a deep level of analysis that it takes, it takes a lot to get to that place. And it's the reason why, like, I argue all the time with, with Amy Lundy, for example, because Amy is, she agrees with Craig O'Shaughnessy that unforced errors shouldn't be tracked as a statistic because you don't know what is actually causing the errors and therefore what is unforced. And while I understand the linguistic argument there and perhaps unforced isn't the right word, I also think that you need to categorize the errors that are committed from neutral and offensive positions versus the errors that are extracted in pressurized defensive situations. So your contact point was disrupted or your court position was disrupted or your opponent came to net and now you're having to hit a passing shot. That's a disruption and usually isn't going to go down as an unforced error unless it was a really easy pass. 
So that's why I believe in separating errors and unforced errors. But now, let's say I have a stat that so-and-so made 10 unforced errors in the set. Now it's up to me in my analytical mind to parse what the reason is. And I, I think stats, if we really got into it, I could probably figure out ways where stats can can give a helping hand in that category. But for the most part, it's not going to hold your hand. All right. Um, one more. Let's do Jake. Jake5134. I know there's been team talk recently, but this is a pretty damning and sad quote. Quote, I'm no longer the player of 2020. My wrist doesn't allow me to give the ball the power I would like to give in baseline rallies. All but confirms he'll never get back to the heights if he can't rip through the ball like he used to. That was his biggest weapon. Yes, that was his biggest weapon. I wanted to include this comment because I saw the quote. Am I the only person who's kind of relieved that he said this? Because there was a period in time where he was saying, the wrist is good. It's The wrist is fine. It's mental. It's mental. And I was like, it's mental? How is it mental? Um, and, and that was actually bothering me because I couldn't make sense of it. it. Not that there are mental issues. That I totally respect and, and am, am open to. But the fact that he was saying, I'm not hitting my forehand big and that's mental. That's where I'm like, what? But like... Wouldn't there at least be flashes? Like, let's say it's a confidence thing. Even if it's a confidence thing, wouldn't you like at certain periods in time rekindle that magic maybe for a little bit or maybe you'd, you'd get there eventually? It's like, how can it be mental that you just can't generate the same amount of heaviness that you used to be able to generate on your forehand? That That didn't make any sense to me. So it's as a... Look, as somebody who tries to wants to make sense of things and understand things, it was actually a relief to me that team said this. Look, quick example here. Del Potro's left wrist, it it never got better, right? I mean, Del Potro's left wrist never healed. Ultimately, it was the knees that ended Delpo's career, not the left wrist, because Delpo actually ended up maintaining an a pretty elite level of tennis. Uh, just slicing his backhand and hitting the drive unbelievably flat with very little left wrist action. So that was admirable from Del Potro's part. But, you know, for team, it's the right wrist, it's the forehand. And yeah, it's it's exactly what I've said this whole time. There might be other mental stuff with the fitness and the motivation, perhaps uh, the, the work rate that he's able to accomplish. But it does boil down to the idea that the reason why team was an elite player was his forehand and he hasn't had the forehand. So um, I know I've, I covered this on the last mailbag, but I did see that quote. And again, it, as sad as it was, I, I am almost glad to see it because it, there's a certain piece I think that it brings just to understand and know the situation and to um, maybe adjust expectations accordingly and get more realistic about what the situation is. All right. Um, hate to end it on that bitter, sad note, but, um, hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.